Oh god, oh no, it's bad. 19 years. 19 f***ing years. Life is a nightmare. Don't ever believe in anything. Would be a brief summation on my thoughts on Shenmue 3, the long-awaited sequel to, unsurprisingly, Shenmue 1 and 2. And I love these games. Granted, their gameplay has aged about as well as this very real Richard Nixon presidential campaign badge, but in 1999, these games were insane. They were the industry's first foray into massive 3D open-world games, with a budget and scope that was new and different and mind-blowing. And it was their director, Yu Suzuki, that drove that a strange but passionate fellow who in a very real way revolutionized the games industry again and again and to him Shenmue was the opportunity to bring about a new era of gaming which is why it was so hard to watch Shenmue fade into obscurity and why each failed attempt to bring it back was so painful because you knew at the heart of these games there was a person who really cared who really believed in them but as the years went on, Yu Suzuki 2 would disappear from the industry. But that's why it was so exciting when, in E3 2015, Yu Suzuki re-emerged, walked out on stage, and announced that after 14 years, Shenmue 3 was entering development, fueled by a Kickstarter campaign that would go on to be backed by 69,000 people. And as one of those people, I can tell you it felt like more than just backing a video game, but giving this legend one final chance to cement his legacy. Which is why it's so hard to write this next sentence. I have played Shenmue 3 to completion twice, and... Oh god. This is the most disappointed I've been in a game since I realized Peter Molyneux was a crazy person and until the last third of the Final Fantasy VII Remake. And if you've followed me for a while, you know the deal here. I don't like to shit on stuff for the sake of it, but I will if it's something that means a lot to me. And if you've seen my other video, Shenmue does. I have tried, God help me, I have tried to love this game, but Shenmue 3 feels like a relic of outdated game design while simultaneously being a far worse experience than the original games, destroying any potential the series had. But before we get into how disappointing I feel this game is, I think it's only right to acknowledge that there are some positives to it. A lot of talented people put a lot of hard work into this, and so I think it's only fair to take a moment and talk about some of the things I I genuinely liked about Shenmue 3. Shenmue 3 raised $6.3 million on Kickstarter, and despite some additional funding from Sony, Deep Silver, and Slacker backers, any reasonable estimate of its budget would still only be at a fraction of the original games, which, adjusting for inflation, was about $70 million. But despite this, very few of my problems with this game are budget-related. In fact, I think if anything, the team has done a great job building an open world on limited resources. Technically, the game runs fine, and even more than that, it can be a times straight up beautiful, from the apricot skies of Bailu village to the torch flame soaked nights of Nihilo city. The environments of Shenmue are gorgeous, and particularly its interiors. There's one section of the game where you explore the home of a rural Chinese stonemason, and wow, it really feels like the home of a rural Chinese stonemason. The house littered with all these unusual tools, jars of ink, and even magazines on stonemasonry. And even by modern standards, it's really impressive. This same sense of presentation carries through to a lot of Shenmue 3, from the game's really well-directed action scenes to the occasional injection of goofy humor, there's a care put into these moments that make them shine, and that's also true of the game's minigames. Every side activity, whether you're chopping wood, training your one-inch punch, or just gambling, it all looks and sounds great, and one of these activities is even the return of the capsule toy minigames, now featuring these really nicely modeled little miniatures of the characters of Shenmue in a very cute and welcome homage to the originals, even if Ryo holding a tiny forklift version of himself is a little... 
There's a real nostalgia here. The moment the game opened up and I watched Ryo exit a cave I'd walked him into 19 years ago, I made a noise like And likewise, seeing characters fully rendered that for years have only existed in concept art is awesome. Even Chai's back, guys. Chai! This is clearly a game made by people who really love Shenmue and nothing about it feels like a shameless cash-in. And that's maybe the most impressive thing about Shenmue 3. It exists. After 19 years and a nearly endless avalanche of delays, cancellations and setbacks, Yu Suzuki did it. He released his vision and made his game, and whatever else I say this video, I still have a massive amount of respect for this man and everything he's been able to achieve. And unfortunately, that's the last positive thing I have to say about Shenmue 3. This is a game so baffling in its game design and construction that just trying to piece together how it all ended up like this was a huge part of putting together this video. And unfortunately, a lot of this comes back to Yu Suzuki as a game designer. And you can feel this the moment you step out into Shenmue's bizarre and broken world. When you first step out into Bailu Village, most of your time in Shenmue 3 will be spent locating the correct NPC to talk to in order to advance the story. And by advance the story, I do of course mean be told about the next NPC you need to talk to. These interactions are the breadcrumb trail that leads you through the game, and they are... So strange. Some of the character models for NPCs look fine, cute even, but others look like the Titans from Attack on Titan shrunk down and squeezed into people clothes. And if they look kind of uncanny, just wait until they speak. There is nothing I could write to illustrate to you how surreal these conversations are, so I'm just going to play you the very first one of the entire game. Enjoy. Hey, Shenhua. We have to get to the village. Let's go. Do you have any idea where your father might have gone? No, I don't. Hmm. Has this ever happened before? With my father? Yeah. Has he ever disappeared without telling you? No, never. I see. Conversations are filled with these really strange fades to black, only to continue like nothing happened. Characters will constantly react to things that have not been said, or even refer to events that have already happened as if they're about to happen, making it feel like the characters are talking to each other from alternate universes. I'm looking for someone named Yuan. No, I haven't. Come to apprentice under me, have you? Oh, nothing. And look, I'm a huge fan of weird interactions with strange characters, but the problem is when you get past the sheer uncanniness of these conversations, no one ever really says anything. 95% of your conversations will be about where Ryo needs to walk next, with very little character given to these characters, meaning they just feel like living, breathing signposts their sole existence and service of pointing Ryo to his next destination. And yeah, the dialogue of the original Shenmue games were also bizarre, and you could argue that that was part of their charm. I do! But localizations like this did not exist back then, and that charm comes from the fact that no one knew what the fuck they were doing, but trying in earnest anyway, leading to decisions like Yu Suzuki, who spoke no English, hiring English voice actors based on how much they looked like the characters they were playing. And so you can't recreate the sincerity of that charm because it was indicative of the time the game was made. And seeing those problems echo 20 years later when everyone should really know better, that was my first indication that maybe not all was right with this game because it hadn't made any attempt to learn from the two decades since the original game. And man, I hope this isn't foreshadowing for a much bigger problem. Oh God! In interviews leading up to Shenmue 3, Yu Suzuki's been outspoken about the fact that he not only does not play video games, but also that modern video games had zero influence on the design of Shenmue 3. And look, on the surface, that doesn't need to be a problem. 
problem. In the same way outsider art can be cool and weird and different because of its ignorance of established conventions, I think that's part of what let Yu Suzuki shatter expectation with Shenmue 20 years ago. A big part of what made those games special is that they were some of the first games to ever try and create a feeling of versimilitude. The feeling of an experience being true or real. It was fucking crazy and new and different to experience a game that lets you open every drawer and pick up every item. A game that brought mundane daily life into focus in a way that nothing else did. The problem is that that was a mind-blowing concept in 1999, but in 2019, it's not. Instead, it leads to the kind of game design that is so tedious and maddening, but permeates every square inch of this game. And to show you what I mean here, I want to walk you through a typical morning in Shenmue 3. Shenmue 3 runs off a 24-hour clock, with Ryo waking up at 8am and going to bed at 9pm. And here is how your typical morning goes. You walk through Shunwa's house, Shunwa being the girl chosen by fate to assist Ryo on a quest and being the sidekick of his adventure. And some days you'll meet her in the kitchen and when you do, this cutscene triggers. Good morning, Ryo. Good morning. Did you get enough rest? Yeah. And okay, that's a little annoying, but where things get a little more frustrating is that off to the side of the main hall, there's this sitting area, which if you enter, automatically triggers a cutscene of Ryo taking off his shoes. And so then you have to turn around 180 degrees and leave, exiting the sitting area, triggering yet another cutscene of Ryo putting back on his shoes. The problem being that Ryo controls like a forklift whether or not he is actually driving a forklift. So nudge the control stick a degree too far and you'll send him into the sitting area, triggering the taking off shoes animation, turn around, leave, trigger the putting on shoes animation, and... And then finally, we can leave and start the day, except we can't because take a couple of steps out of the house and this cutscene triggers. Leo. Hmm? See you later. Yeah. This happens every single day morning. You cannot skip it and it does not change. And if that sounds aggravating, just imagine playing it and we've only gotten as far as our front gate. It might sound like I'm being pedantic, but what you gotta understand is this is everything in Shenmue 3. Everything is a struggle, right down to moving Ryo through this world. While running around, you may notice that Ryo's health is constantly falling, and this is because of the game's brand new hunger mechanic. Over the course of a day, Ryo's stamina will fall until eventually he stops and voices his displeasure in this honestly quite relatable line. I better eat something before I fall over. But when this happens, he also loses the ability to run. Meaning if you have no food items, your only choice is to slowly walk back to the village while you wait for Ryo's health to regenerate. And compounding this problem is that your stamina is also your health. Meaning it can fall over the course of a day as you run about and do your daily business, only for you to be surprised by a story related combat encounter and enter that encounter with only a sliver of life to make it through. And what this usually means is you have to lose, run back and get food, and then run back to the encounter to repeat it. There is so much more. When you get to the hotel in Naiwu, a second unskippable cutscene with the hotel receptionist is added to each morning, in addition to another unskippable cutscene with Shunwa. If you play the Flower, Sun, Bird and Moon gambling game, you have to watch the entire animation play out every time, and if you try and skip it, you automatically forfeit the bet. Although, maybe that's a little petty. I mean, it's not like there's a section of the game where we'll have to play a lot of this. There's a small shrine in Yawu that the game forces you to walk, not run through. The problem being that you have to pass back and forth through this area several times a day, and there are several areas across Yawu like this. If this is to hide loading, I genuinely think loading screens would have been less frustrating. And look at how slowly Rio picks up these apples! Look at it! No, we're just gonna sit here and watch it all! 
I'm sorry, I just, I need you to understand what this game is. There's way more, but I'm going to stop there. What I'm not saying here is that games should be designed around the convenience of the player. In fact, inconveniencing the player, forcing them into situations that are awkward or difficult or mundane can actually be a really powerful storytelling tool, forcing them to reflect on how their actions shape their place within the world or story. And there's one really great example of this that parallels Shenmue's own focus on mundane daily life, but builds on it, and it's in... <sighs> God help me, David Cage's Heavy Rain. This is a game where you play as Ethan, a pretty normal father and architect. The early hours of that game focusing on these mundane daily tasks. Having a shower, brushing your teeth, playing with your kids. With one section in particular sitting you down at your workstation and giving you a simple prompt that leads into a sequence of timed button presses as Ethan gets lost in his work in a novel, if slightly dull, little moment. However, later on in the game, after Ethan's son is killed in an accident, we find ourselves in the same scenario at the same workstation, given the same prompt. But this time, Ethan instead turns to a nearby TV set and watches an old video of him and his son playing before he breaks down crying. Heavy Rain is a silly, silly game, but in this moment I do think it really succeeds in communicating how broken Ethan now is. How the loss of his son has crippled his ability to do things that once came so naturally to him, and that moment would lose a lot of its power without the earlier sections to give it context. In other words, there's a point to the mundanity, it says something about this character. And in the last 20 years, a lot of games have done this. They've used the concept of daily mundanity to say some beautiful and profound things. But Shenmue 3 ignores this. It ignores the legacy it created. Instead, it's a game content to wheel out the same tired game design that was so impressive in 1999, but so meaningless in 2020. And expecting that same reaction when games have moved so far beyond those ideas, it shows Shenmue 3's inability to move on from what it once was, resulting in a game that feels like a tired, tedious relic. I get at this point that some people might say that I'm criticizing Shenmue 3 for basically being Shenmue, and to an extent, I get that. Those games could be dull, this game can be dull. And so now what I want to talk about is an area where Shenmue 3 is so catastrophically worse than the originals that it destroys the entire experience. All around me are familiar faces. I want to quickly talk about two ways games can motivate us to play them, intrinsically and extrinsically. Intrinsic motivation comes from our own internal desire to get better at something, to raise our own skill set within a game. So for example, wanting to learn to reliably pull off a dragon punch in Street Fighter, that's intrinsic motivation, because when we do, nothing about the game has changed. We have. We are internally better at it. Whereas extrinsic motivation is the opposite. This is when the game gives you something for performing a task. Say, beating a turn-based battle in an RPG and being rewarded with experience or items. You likely haven't improved much after a single battle, but the game creates that feeling of progress by giving you an external reward. It's motivating you extrinsically. Neither of these systems is necessarily superior, it just depends on the kind of experience the game is trying to create. Take the combat from the original Shenmue. That was mostly intrinsic. There were slight stat increases you could gain from repeatedly performing the same moves, but these were so off to the side that they barely mattered. And so, your ability to succeed was largely determined by your own skill. And that was because it was based on the Virtua Fighter combat system, fighting games being one of the purest examples of intrinsic reward. And so, it had this emphasis on spacing, timing, and execution. So learning a new move meant really learning a new move. Take the Tornado Kick. To perform this, you had to tap forward twice in quick succession before double tapping kick in a specific rhythm. The move had a long startup and left you vulnerable, so if you wanted to incorporate it into your move set, you had to understand its timing and distance. And considering how few fights there were in Shenmue, you could only really do this by going to a parking lot and practicing 
chasing it. But the reward was when you actually managed to pull it off in combat. Man, that felt amazing. It looked great and it had high damage. But most of all, there was this feeling that your skills had advanced. You had learned the subtleties of this move and made it your own. And you could feel this same intrinsic motivation with each punch, kick, block, throw, and counter, all of which had their own weight and timing that felt, mm, it felt so good. Watch someone who really knows what they're doing with the combat system in Shenmue, and there's this kind of hypnotic flow to it, and it shows you just how high the skill ceiling of this game actually was meaning there's this real intrinsic motivation to get better at it. And what's cool is this intrinsic motivation was the player's link to Ryo. About Ryo's only defining character traits besides his wooden stoicness and dead dad was his love of martial arts, and a big part of his character was his drive to get better at them and to grow stronger. And so, by incentivizing you to master each new move and learn the combat system as well as you could, each new technique you mastered felt like it brought both you and Ryo one step closer to being able to face Lon D. And what Shenmue 3 does is it takes all this and fires it into the fucking sun. My first clue that something was very wrong with Shenmue 3's combat came in its tutorial screen. Just hit the circle, triangle, square X buttons. Try pressing the OR2 button. This is how Shenmue 3 introduces you to its brand new combat system and... Thanks? But it was only later when reading over an old Game Informer interview with Yu Suzuki that I started to understand why the tutorial is like this, as well as the core problems plaguing Shenmue 3's combat. As he stated, he wanted to create a more approachable combat system that even players with low skill could play, where just pressing buttons randomly would make something meaningful happen. And on the surface, yeah, appealing to a wider audience is admirable. But the problem is how that entire philosophy warps the combat of Shenmue into something that barely resembles the original. Here is how combat works in Shenmue 3. It doesn't! And I mean that. The focus of Shenmue 3's combat is not the actual combat, it's these minigames. Throughout the game's world, there are a variety of these training spots where Ryo can take part in a variety of tedious activities in order to level up his attack and defense stats. And it's these stats that dictate how much damage Ryo will deliver and receive in combat. In other words, the entire focus of this series' combat has shifted from intrinsically raising your own skill to extrinsically leveling up Ryo's stats so he has the numbers to survive encounters. And again, on the surface, that didn't need to be a problem, but where the real issue lies is how underconsidered the actual combat mechanics are, forcing you to rely on these stat increases. And this is something you can feel as soon as you take control of Ryo, and instantly something feels very, very wrong, in that when you hit a button, Ryo won't actually perform the move associated with that button. Instead, he'll enter this kind of delayed buffer state. This is likely done because all special commands are now mapped to the four face buttons rather than using directional inputs like the old games in order to simplify combat. But the problem is that it creates this lag as Ryo waits to see if you're going to enter any additional button presses after your first. To be clear, this is not the same as a slow startup animation, but that there's an inherent delay between you hitting the button and Ryo performing the animation, and it's that way by design. This creates all kinds of problems, but one of the biggest is it takes away your ability to meaningfully react to your enemy, as by the time Ryo actually performs the move you entered, the combat situation will have moved on and the spacing and timing will be completely different. And what this results in is that you never feel in full control of Ryo, but more like you are suggesting actions to him that he may perform at some point in the future. You can quick bind moves to or two that he will instantaneously perform, but all this does is incentivize you to spam one move over and over and over. 
This is not the only thing that makes you feel barely in control of Shenmue's combat. In the original games, a successful block would trigger specific block animations depending on the move being blocked. And not only did this really add to that satisfying weighty feel as you blast your opponent's attacks back at them, but it also created openings for both you and your opponent to counter. But in Shenmue 3, this does not happen. Blocking an opponent's attacks just triggers Ryo to flail his hands randomly in the air with no blowback to your enemies at all. And not only does it make all the impacts feel floaty and weightless, but that lack of impact makes it difficult to tell when you're getting hit and when your attacks are actually landing. Meaning you don't have the visual information to make meaningful split second decisions in combat. Instead, fights have all the weight and strategy of two people flailing their limbs in front of each other until one gets tired and lies down. So what all this means is you inevitably come across a high level enemy and God help you if it's enemies. And because the combat system doesn't give you either the tools or visual information to meaningfully react to your opponents, they will break your guard and burn your health in just a couple of attacks. And so your only option is to grind out stat increases over and over and over until finally you have high enough numbers to just steamroll whatever enemy is gatekeeping your progress. And I know this is how the game is intended to be played because practically every enemy in the game tells you this, tells you to go and train after they beat you. Meaning combat is no longer a test of your strategy, skill or reactions, but just your patience in enduring these mini games. And in fairness, yes, this in a way is a more approachable combat system in that anyone who is willing to grind out the experience points will be able to randomly mash their way through it. But in that misguided attempt to draw in a wider player base, Shenmue 3 has destroyed that satisfying intrinsic motivation that was so core to the original games and replaced it with something lifeless, limp and meaningless. Okay, here's where we're at. Exploration, bad. Combat, very bad. But there's still hope. There's still a way Shenmue 3 could make good on all its potential. And it's in its story. We've been waiting 19 years for Ryo's quest to avenge his father to continue. And the fact that it's here is huge. Which is why it's so frustrating that for 95% of this game, the story is nothing. And as for the remaining 5%, <laughs> oh, we'll get there. Don't you worry, we'll get there. What I mean here is that for 95% of Shenmue 3, Things happen, people say things, but there is no story. And to show you what I mean here, I am now going to take you through a couple of hours of Shenmue 3. And I will warn you now, you are on the precipice of a world of madness and insanity. So just imagine playing it instead of listening to it, and welcome to my hell. Not long after Ryo arrives in Bailu village, he discovers that Shunwa's father has gone missing. And from here, you follow a breadcrumb trail that eventually leads you to this big strong man, who with two of his cronies has taken over an entire suburb of the village holding its residents hostage. Ryo and the big strong man fight, the big strong man beats up Ryo, and you awaken two days later, where you learn that the big strong man is still in the same area of the village and still holding it hostage. And for some reason, no one's done anything about it. Bailu village is home to a martial arts temple, a patrol of armed guards, and several different martial arts masters, but no, it's up to this teenage boy to solve the problem. And no matter how many days pass, the big strong man is always standing in this one area waiting for Ryo to come fight him. In order for Ryo to be able to fight the big strong man, Ryo decides he needs to learn a special technique to beat him. So you go and talk to the village's resident kung fu master. Not this one, not this one, but this one. But he refuses to teach you anything because it will take too 
long, while also not explaining why he won't go fight the big strong man himself, but then Ryo remembers Grandmaster Sun, an old hermit who lives in a temple who you've previously met on a different questline, where the only way to speak to him was to leave wine and buns by his front porch and then hide, waiting for him to emerge like he's some kind of strange kung fu squirrel and then approach him, at which point you can ask him one of two questions, both of which you need answered to progress the story, but try and ask him more than one question and he's like, hey motherfucker, more wine and buns. And so you have to run back to the village, buy his wine and buns, go back to him, and he answers your second question. Okay, back to our current timeline. You go back to Sun, explain your problem, but he's like, ah, 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 wine and buns, back to the village, buy the wine, buy the buns, ask him to teach you some martial arts, but then he's like, oh, ho, you want me to teach you martial arts? Well, that's gonna take a lot of wine and buns, and specifically, 50 year old Lao Jo wine. And so your quest now is to track down this ultra rare wine without any indication of where throughout Bailu village it might be. And when you ask around, everyone tells you to check out this one store. And so when you go there, the old lady who runs it is like, hmm, I'm not sure if we have that. Maybe take a look around the store yourself. Which, I mean, I really think is her job, but okay, okay. So you look around the store and eventually Rio just says, there's nothing 50 years old here. I'd better try another. But why did the game tell me to come here if this was not how to progress the story? Okay, I'm sorry, I'm just getting frustrated. See, it turns out the actual wine is hidden in this barrel in this general store at the start of the game. So finally, you found the wine, you bring it to the counter, and it costs 2,000 yuan. This is a massive amount of money in Shenmue's world. At this point, you have maybe two or three hundred total, and collecting herbs or chopping wood it will only add a pittance to that, so this is going to take hours. So surely there's a better way. And there is, at least according to the people of Bailu Village, many of which point you towards a fortune teller that can predict the results of the flower sun burden moon gambling gig god damn it and it's like oh there's my solution only not quite see you pay the fortune teller to predict the correct colors go bet on the color but you can't bet money you have to exchange money for tokens then gamble those tokens which you can only do in very small amounts but then you can't just exchange those tokens back for money you have to take the tokens to the prize exchange in a different part of the village exchange those tokens for prizes and then take those prizes to a pawn shop and then pawn those prizes for money and it's a pain, but fine, this is how you do it, this is how you get the 2000 yuan. Except kind of not, because the predicted results from the fortune teller only work some of the time. The fortune teller will give you the correct colour to bet on, but all this does is raise the likelihood of the ball landing on that colour, it does not guarantee it. And it only lasts a short amount of time, meaning you have to run back to the fortune teller to keep your predictions somewhat accurate, with a bad run of luck, meaning you can actually lose money doing this no matter what the fortune teller predicted. A reminder that we are doing all this to beat this big strong man in a fight. And so you do this for an hour and you take your winnings to the prize exchange, to the pawn shop, and <laughs> you don't even have close to enough. Back to gambling, back to prize exchange, back to pawn shop, and at this point in the footage, I was nearly there. So back for one more gamble and I lose, and I lose, and I lose nearly a third of my money. And do you feel yourself staring into an infinite abyss of a world without logic? or compassion but no it's fine it's fine we'll do this back to gambling back to prize exchange back to pawn shop and finally we've done it we have two thousand dollars to buy the fucking wine back to squirrel man and now finally we learn the move after we undergo his special training where we have to catch 10 chickens, the day ends, back to bed, off to the temple, more chicken catching, more training, back to bed, off to the temple. 
Fuck See you later. off, Shunwa! Back to the temple, get sent to another temple, fight these guys, back to the original temple, and finally, we learn the move, the body check, and in fairness, it's, it's pretty cool. Back to Hermit's Nest, not enough health, back to village, eat food, back to Big Strong Man, who has at this point been standing here for about a week, but what does it matter? What does anything matter? Defeat Big Strong Man, save the day, you may now progress the game, and oh my god, oh my god, this took hours the story has not progressed we haven't learned anything new about Landy why did we do this why did we have to do this and then something really weird happens Shenmue 3 gets good not long after your showdown with the big strong man this location change and you travel to the port side city of Nyo and Yewu is really beautiful. It has a totally different energy to Bailu Village and is packed with all these really interesting stalls and shops. The story even starts to pick up with the introduction of both the Red Snakes, a violent criminal gang, and Ren's back, guys! Ren! Ryo's very real disdain for his sexy pirate boyfriend being genuinely quite entertaining. Other fun side characters are introduced, there's a really well done chase sequence, and it's just fun, and it's like, oh my god, yes, this is awesome, this is all I wanted, this is Shenmue. And then you meet a big, strong man who beats Ryo in a fight, and Ryo decides he needs to learn a special technique to beat him, and you have to search the entire city for a technique scroll, and when you find it, it's... It's 5,000 yuan! And everyone's like, have you heard about the fortune teller? And it's like, no, no, you Suzuki, why? Why would you do this? Why is this what you made? And then, and then, when you finally, after hours by the scroll, the last page is missing, and you can't even learn the move, but then an old man with a bird just teaches you the move anyway, and it's the same move, it's the same move you already learned, like the animation's the exact same, and why? 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 And oh my god, I've wasted my entire fucking life waiting for this game! Was Shenmue ever actually good? No! No! No, I, I do! I, I love Shenmue! I always have! They can still turn it around! There's still hope! There's still... Landy! Despite the fact that he appears for less than 10 minutes total across all games, in a lot of ways, Landy is Shenmue. It's been two decades since he set the story in motion by killing Ryo's father in Shenmue 1, and left that story on an agonizing cliffhanger as he disappeared into the horizon at the end of Shenmue 2. And in the time since then, his absence has made him legendary. The prospect of finally facing Lan Di after so many years, that was a huge part of what made that initial announcement so exciting. And also why it's so frustrating when 19 hours into this 20 hour game, Lan Di has barely been mentioned. Until... I am now going to spoil the final hour of Shenmue 3. If you have not played this game and still want to, skip here. I do not recommend this, but you can. Ryo and his allies storm an old castle where the Red Snakes have taken Shunwa, only to learn that Landi is waiting for them. And after wading through more enemies than you face the entire rest of the game, Ryo and Ren break into the castle's highest chamber, and there, surrounded by his men, sits Lan Di. And honestly, I gotta say, this moment got me. I had waited most of my life for this, and finally experiencing it was thrilling. And in that instant, every problem I had with this game just fell away. Ryo steps towards Landy, and then Landy blocks all your moves, beats Ryo, gets distracted, and Ryo runs away. 19 years! Meaning, the last 5% of this game is also nothing! Was that disappointing? Is the fact that I alluded earlier in the video that there might be something here now a massive disappointment? 
Well, multiply that feeling by 19 years and now you know what it's like to be a fan of Shenmue. There is no narrative progression. Both Ryo and Landy end this game the exact way they started it. You could cut this entire game out of Shenmue canon and it wouldn't matter. Meaning we waited 19 years for a Shenmue filler episode. And what kills me is that it didn't need to be like this. I'm now gonna do something I very rarely do. I'm gonna say how I would fix the end of Shenmue 3. And I want to acknowledge that it's the height of hubris to say a piece of art is bad and that you could fix it despite having never worked in the industry it was created. But that's what I'm about to do. So first, some rules. One, my new ending cannot add any additional cost to development, so no new asset creation. We have to work with what's already there. Two, Yu Suzuki has expressed that his goal with this game was not to conclude Shenmue's story, so we can't do that either. And three, finally, I'm not gonna change anything outside the events of this throne room. Even with these limitations in place, I think it would have been totally possible to give this entire game meaning with this one scene, and this is how I do it. First off, take everyone who is not Ryo or Landi out of this scene. They only take away from the magnitude of this moment, and so now it's just Ryo and Landi face to face and alone, and that's huge. We give the player a moment to take in the weight of 19 years. Just as we do, they both know what has to happen here, and without a word, the fight begins, and it's the same. Ryo can't touch Landy, while Landy's attacks are overwhelming and unstoppable. But just as the light begins to fade for Ryo, time slows to a crawl, and the quick time event for the body check appears on screen. We hit it, and boom! Ryo slams his body into Landy for the first time ever, landing an attack on the man who killed his father. And Landy doesn't go down, but he does stumble. The music cuts out, and for a moment, there's just this stillness. Landy is slowly turning to face Ryo, and Ryo stares back at him, his eyes filled with determination. Fury flashes across Landy's face, and he lunges forward, striking Ryo down with the same attack he used to kill Ryo's father at the very beginning of Shenmue 1, Ryo collapsing to the ground, crumpled and lifeless. Landy stands over the fallen Ryo, readying one final killing blow. But suddenly, he just freezes. And he stands there, staring down at the unconscious boy, and a glimmer of conflict flickers across his face. Maybe it's his pride refusing to let him finish a downed opponent, or maybe he's just now realizing the cycle of bloodshed he's become a part of. We don't know. And slowly, Landy turns and walks away. Later, Ryo's friends discover him just as he's regaining consciousness. Ryo, his face a cocktail of disappointment and determination, whispers, Lan D. We cross dissolve to a scene of Landy staring out over a vast ocean, his brow furrowed, his lips tense, a conflicted, distant look in his eyes. I'm not saying this ending is good, I am saying it's something. Think about what we achieve. First off, it takes the body check, that completely pointless move we spent the entire game building to, and it gives that build purpose. There's now a massive emotional payoff to all that time and all that pain it took to learn this move because now it's become the bridge over the gap between Ryo and Landy, and this fundamentally changes their relationship. Landy is no longer the invincible god he was at the start of the game, there's now a crack in his armor, and that crack is the ultimate testament to the 19 year journey it took to get here. Ryo's grown, Meaning to Landy, he isn't just an insignificant threat anymore, but someone who's forced Landy to actually get serious, and by doing so, not only humiliating him, but making Landy reflect on his actions that brought them both to this point, resulting in his moment of hesitation. And this moment humanizes Landy, 
even just a little, and we've spent two decades chasing this villain. It's time to give him some nuance and develop his character. And so both Ryo and Lan Di have progressed, but more importantly, so has their relationship, meaning the central narrative thread of this whole story has advanced, and that's not something the actual ending does making this entire game and the 19 year wait for it meaningless. The only question I have to ask now is, what is the point of this game? It's clearly not intended as a conclusion to the story, and Yu Suzuki was open about that before its release, but it's also not a continuation of this story either, evidenced by the fact that the story does not continue, so what is it then? And I think there's an answer to that question, and it comes after the closing credits in a personal letter from Yu Suzuki to the player, ending with the words, I will never give up on my own personal journey to complete its story. Together, we can continue to spin the tale of Ryo and his adventures in Shenmue 4. I don't know Yu Suzuki, and I don't know what's going on in the man's head, but my feeling is that Shenmue 3 was not created as a sequel to Shenmue 1 and 2, it was created as a prequel to Shenmue 4. The entire driving philosophy behind this game doesn't feel like it was to continue Shenmue, but to reboot it. To bring the series back exactly as it was 20 years ago, and all the fanfare that surrounded it. And when you look at it like this, it explains so much. Why its open world feels like a relic from the past. Why the combat has been simplified in the hopes of bringing in a new audience. And why its story does nothing except reintroduce this world and these characters. Shenmue 3 is an attempt to return to an era when the open world games were still virgin territory and Yu Suzuki was still a rock star of the video game industry. And when I look at this game now, what I see is a person trying to recapture their past, but at the expense of the game they were trying to make and the story they were trying to tell. And it doesn't work. And it hasn't worked. In its first week, Shenmue 3 sold less than 18,000 copies, less than both Astral Chain and Code Vein. And if you haven't heard of either of those games, exactly. With its publisher Deep Silver even publicly commenting on the disappointing sales figures, with similarly low numbers posted all over the world. And yet, despite everything, Yu Suzuki is adamant that Shenmue 4 will happen still. I'm never gonna shit on someone for following their dreams, but as someone who really loved this series, I think this might be it. I think Shenmue is over. When you first enter your hotel room in Nialu, there's a book beside Ryo's bed, and if you open it, it's filled with notes from the different Kickstarter backers. People thanking Yu Suzuki, writing what a big part of their lives the original Shenmue's were, and how it ignited their passion for Japanese culture and shaped their careers. How now, a lifetime later, they want to have these same experiences with their kids. Some even dedicating their entries to lost loved ones who will never get to experience this third game. And it's hard to read this and not to get a little emotional. Not to feel what a big part of people's lives these games were. And I really mean it when I say this, but I hope these people found what they were looking for in this game. And if they did, I don't mean for this video to diminish those experiences. If anything, I envy them. But for me, ultimately, what Shenmue 3 is, is what happens when you can't let go of the way things were. And I don't just mean that about Yu Suzuki. I mean it about me. I mean it about us. And I think it's time to move on. And honestly, that kills me. 
friends, thank you for joining me today. I want to give a brief thank you to at Brobex on Twitter for doing the incredible storyboards on this video. She's an awesome illustrator. Go check her stuff out. If you'd like to help me make more videos like this, you can do so for just a single dollar over at patreon.com forward slash super eyepatchwolf, where you'll get access to Patreon only video logs, my Discord, and hey, even the occasional early video. This video in particular, I'd like to thank Knight of Knights. Naomi Spicer, Slim Steven, Jess Simpson, Sheena, Big Boopy, and Akim Babam. Find me over on the Let's Fight a Boss video game podcast or on Twitter at iPatchWolf. Friends, take care of yourselves, and I'll see you next time.